Good evening and welcome. Some years ago, when I was teaching at the University of Notre Dame, that pious and athletic institution <laughs> was minded to hire a poet, a process which I well remember entailed a particular colleague scrutinizing every application for ominous signs of theory or religious unorthodoxy and summarily rejecting those so tainted. Out of those who survived this screening and subsequent interrogation on a campus visit, <laughs> Joelle McSweeney emerged to torment that colleague's sleep. Oh. For she is Indiana's nightmare, an emanation from the business-friendly dunes and toxic dumps. The anointed Joelle staring about her after touchdown at South Bend Airport ripped off her mask and at once trained her blowtorch on the rust belt, generating a heat and energy and mephitic stench, <laughs> which has, if anything, it intensified over the years. As she exclaimed in an interview, I can't get my exuberance under control. It's more volatile than my rage. My rage then has to express itself with the items my exuberance has purchased at the mall, like a pair of Adidas and a copy of the Aeneid. You can tell it's South Bend. Yeah. Joelle is an extraordinary poet. She adheres stickily to the tradition of Georges Bataille as a votary of all that offends mental hygiene and all that offends economy. She is a poet of waste, excess, of potlash, of the disgusting, the viscous, the oozing, the excremental, of rubbish, of what will not stay within bounds. The characteristic procedure of her work involves onchosis, where swelling of the cells occurs. The cells then proceed to blebbing, and this is followed by pycnosis, in which nuclear shrinkage transpires. In the final step of this writing, the nucleus is dissolved into cytoplasm, that is, cryolysis. Median lethal dose is estimated at one chapbook. Joyelle adores the kitsch, the fake, the poisonous sweetmeat, the gaudy, the rococo, the trans, the reverse, the transcriptase. Her feminism scoffs at the ambition to head Hewlett Packard. Doesn't just scoff, but belches, bleeds, and makes a mess in the marble lobby. Her flag is a blood-soaked placenta crossed with a Twinkie. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I can go on. Her, her excess is more than a parody of capitalism's excess. It exposes the filthy tailings and in such stuff smears its effigies. She writes, you just have to wade through the playground of the present, give up and lie down in it as the flood waters rise from the reverse drains, sewage riven, bearing tissue and garbage. The present tense resembles you in all its spumy and spectacolor 3D. For Joyelle does not believe in the future. She is particular about where she is in the present in Indiana. I see the rust belt, she writes, as the kind of canary in the coal mine for unsurvivable American life, and also as a kind of mine shaft linking to other barely habitable world habitats. Just the name of the region says it all. Chemicals are everywhere. If you don't want your baby to get skin cancer, you have to cover her with carcinogenic chemicals. If you want to talk to your mom on the phone, you have to hoist to your ear metals harvested by forced labor in Africa, when your phone dies, you can send it to be picked apart for its toxic metals by children in China, but be sure to upload your baby pictures to the cloud first. Action Books, the press which Joyelle directs with Johannes Gorenson, draws its bacterial library of necrotizing literature from around the world. <laughs> At times, it seems to aim to make the shade of Dessard go paler, but to dial down the rhetoric for some serious advertisement, while Action Books does publish American poetry, its chief distinction lies in its commitment to translation. It is among the most admirable and influential current publishers of poetry, and you should make your way often to its associated web magazine, Action Yes, and also to the table of books on sale just outside. E. As for Joyelle's critical writing, it does sterling service in rescuing poets as different as Wilfred Owen and M. S. Césaire from freezer bags and devotional niches and she's particularly good on Wilfred Owen, I should say. These outpourings are collected in the Necropastoral Poetry Media Occults, which was published by the University of Michigan this year. Joel's most recent poetical publication is the play Dead Youth or the Leaks, whose dramatist personae are Henrietta Lacks, multiple dead youth, there's something here of William Burroughs, Julian Assange, 
Abdi Wali Abdul Qadir Muse, a Somali ship hijacker, if you've forgotten, and Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. She has published six previous books of poetry and prose, most of which also contain plays, Salamandrine, Eight Gothics, Percussion Grenade, Flet, Nyland, The Sarcographer, The Commandrine, and The Red Bird. Many of them are published by Fence. And again, a couple of books are available outside. So none of what I've said quite captures, I think, the peculiar tone of Joyelle's writing. Especially it fails to suggest that at its best it exhibits a knife edge poise which for all the subject matter cuts a line of strange elegance. Recently it has delivered acts of observation so clear that amidst all the Midwestern trash and excess and amidst the shopping aisle, poetry of self-inflation and linguistic hypertrophy, it has come to sound really weird. I think this is the dialectic of Joyle's work when spraying the cesspits and stagnant waterways with the contents of some corroding drums of chemical waste, an unexpected reaction occurs, and the water suddenly clears. I'll end with a few lines from Dead Youth, which I think show what I mean. Ask the tribalite. He knows what it's like to be suspended in media, to have the knowledge of centuries and no freedom. The prairie used to be a sea, but now its bed is blocked in upright limestone and has to supervise the food court at the Coral Ridge Mall in Coralville, Iowa, shift after shift. It has to tolerate AC forever or hold up the old Capitol walls, overseeing the 4-H speech competition, drone, drone forever, and can never clock out and can never sleep and is suffered no ambien. Poor tribalite, you have suffered a sea change. Joyle McSweeney. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Of course, thank you for that amazing introduction, which really I I'm, can definitely get behind. I think you, you talked about a lot of the themes and a lot of the things that are important to me, and I'm excited just to rip into it. So should we do it? Another thing I should probably add that is that my work can often seem very like ecstatic and even ridiculous, um, and hopefully a little bit sublime too. But it's coming from a pretty real place, which is like a concern with the disorientation and the f fatality of trying to live at this moment moment on this planet, and not just for humans, but for pretty much all the other species that we're going to take down to. You know, in that sense, this is like definitely an Anthropocene poetics, and it's coming from a place of dismay that's constantly converting into um, kind of exuberance by a kind of sublime mechanism, which is magic. And we can talk about that tomorrow. First, I'm just going to read you some poems. Does that sound okay? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to read is just some musical, a very musical poem just to set the mood, and then I'll probably read stuff from the play, if that sounds good to you. A friend of mine, the poet Samson Starkweather, was having uh, his poet friends remix poems of his for an, an, an album or a book release he was having, and so he gave me a poem that was just a, a set of like maybe 12 phrases and somehow sound took me over um, and moved through the poem he gave me and kind of fracked it up and created all this crazy music. Um, so this really is a poem about fracking and uh, I think that's pretty much all you have to know about it and uh, so here it goes. It's called Yeti Stet, like Yeti, the, the creature that exists and uh, Stet like the editing mark. Yum, purr, um, um, yearn. I met my little fern on the soldier of the berm. Fraught and grape shot like a jar of wheat germ when the damps got in and the funks come out. She said some kind of rain is falling that I feel and cannot see. It leaves its fracky oil all over me. It leaves its funky fluid all over me. She said it leaves its fracky funky fluid all over me. It's fracky funky fluid all over me. My trunk is overrun with the funk she sunk. Whoosh, whoosh, drone hunched down the seaside on the bus. To leafy words, I'm drunken and it got me on my knees. The style hath slipped this coil and the sundial cannot see. Can't tell the dancer from the dance floor or the cancer from the bees that swarm the sun warm layer like inclinations grease. The penthouse of the hijab where the thinking is. The penthouse of the hijab where the thinking is. Throw out the oven door, bake up the petty four, serve them up to Marcel Proust to fetch old lightning some more. Walking out on that moor, mid the asterisky spore, in the trusses, in my trusses, mop the edits of the yetis, where they land their float plane on the spiral jetties, and all the yetis go stet. All the yetis are like jedis, and the ladies go stet. Stet, stet.
And that's how I squandered my meat education. Bye-bye, mortal coil. Fare thee well, incarnation. And every hesitation, histamine or incantation was a prestidigitation. Every headlight lit the core, hammer closed the fire door. Every Costco knew the score. Every carbon-bearing frond had a plan, all right, as it loosed its ferny spore into the web of life. It was hype, all right? It was hype, all right? From my synthetic Yeti hair job to my titanium core. My synthetic Yeti hair job hid my titanium core. As I pulled away in my rickshaw of thought, my feet were like a lamb with a lamprey in its side. It marks us every I am as we limped upon the track. We call that pedagogy when we're hanging in the gyre, like Christmas lights at an L.A. mall. Yeah, we're notational, and you know we've taken over all the nacre that it's heaven, and we're rich, y'all. Rich, rich, y'all. Check the grooves on this record. Check the lacquer on this cat, because we're rich, y'all. Rich, rich. Where I purr, where I yearn, yep, purr, Laura Dern. Do you want to see the gyre? Stet, stet, y'all, stet. Do you want to see the gyre? Stet, stet, y'all, stet. Woo! It was a couple years ago when I asked myself the question, um, where is art going and where has it been? Like, you know, why am I a poet? Where is this poetry coming from? And none of the, none of the models that have been put in front of me really seem to explain it at all. And, and soon I just found... I, I, first I felt about sound, and then I thought about contagion, and then I thought about joy and dismay. And all these things feel like these things that just come into your body and take you over and like press out the other side as art. And that's art's prerogatives. Um, I think it's kind of uncanny. And in my work, it comes out as this like incredible, like to me, sound and diction and, and things that are knit together. And I try to get out of the way and let them knit themselves together first. And then when I edit it, I try to edit it back so that some of that theme or motif comes through. Before I get to the play, I'm going to read a couple sonnets which sounds pretty crazy, right? But uh, among my many exhumations, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about Keats lately and, and wanting to, to crack that urn of his, that Grecian urn, and let him spill out. And the more I started writing these sonnets, the more I realized that I was writing from the perspective of the um, tuberculin. Uh, of the tuberculosis itself and that the sonnets were kind of like lungs and I was like using my diction to kind of grow through these sonnet spaces. But all I really wanted to do was imitate Bright Star, so I don't know what happened. And I'll read you a couple sonnets and then we'll put, then we'll put this away and, and do the play. So here we go. So these are like Keats fan fiction. <laughs> Uh, and that's another thing. It's like I'm getting, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting into that middle age thing, and I'm just like deciding to do the teenage fanhood again, and be like, I love Bright Star. I'm just gonna write it over until I, I've written it out of my system. But that never happened. That these poems just got crazier and crazier. They're toxic sonnets. Here we go. I read about the tubercle at night. I read about the tubercle at night, and I went under. As a crime scene can excite, a drop of lumen to exude its hit of light, I shed wet light. I wrap the motel room in light. I carry knives bladed with sputum and an instinct for spite, like a tree that reaches upward for the heat and wants to burn or lay down in the slurry for the churn to paper. Write me down, chum me, make me into time, then spit me out to lay me in the sawdust like a germ and burn me. I release a noxious smell. Dose me with aminoglycosides till I give in, then lay me in your litter. I'm a threat to life. I'm a threat to life, a violent butter. I spread my toxic inklings like a cloud seeding drone and drop on crops my shake of violet water. As the clotted vena cava sucks dye for the camera, a violent thought turns all my just to anger. A fist of cloud breaks the crowny crater, which vomits up its own grand crew, palpates the sternum of the sky for ulcerations. Oh, fish in flume, resting on your mutagenic breasts, who do you give your milk to? Oh, mouth that cannot close, oh, planet cleft, what what cache of weapons do you lean on as you dream in your plural cavity, desertified, depressed? Bad host, you clutch your guest. Bad host, you clutch your guest. Green seam fluoresces in night vision, signature of heat and flesh. Green ghost lifts its headline to the camera, proof of life washed white by sudden flash. From the satellite, earth turns on a spit like a gut inflorescent with bad intentions. A god descends with gifts of poetry and plague. He lights up factory hens, a baffling intervention. They tote their viral load on wheel, on wing, on breast, transmigrate the globe and upload souls to heaven. Oh, Victor Bird, oh, Vector, I am like you you, a non-state actor, death-fletched, alive, immune to all elixirs. Death-fletched, alive, immune to all elixirs, I sit like a drone pilot at the dock of screens. My attention is a fang that sinks through plasma, like a toxic arrow or a tooth in coke. I'm fine, I'm sick, 
I grip a joystick. Outside, a pink crust announces evening. Buzzards ride, hate signatures at dusk. Inside, plasmodium reshapes itself. Now a slipper, now a gauntlet, tossed down in the gut, and now a glock, a mouse, a mauser, the lucky cloud that mounts the hill to break its blessing on the forehead of the bride or the wedding guest who's dead. Yet cocks his eye at any light now rising in the sky. Like any night light now rising in the sky, I am the arrow. I ride and I decline. My throats and ulcerated weapons cache where radioactive gun sites bleed their toxins in groundwater. Birds rear up deranged. Their mitochondria are scrambled. They cannot steer by stars. I am as disheveled. My lungs raise two black flags inside in warning. Boil like frogs, flap, release flan colored scum. Skim from my lips, my only utterance. My spit is studied for its signs. Gross Sybil. When death leans in, his staff's encircled by a viper. I adorn him with my spittle, with my cipher. With my spittle, with my cipher, I roam the Martian surface. I'm a rogue, alone, a venial rover. I tap a vein. Wind lifts, rides, wrecks nothing. Threshers lie down, tangled in their tresses, trestles, mattocks, manglers, cloaks, felts, fustians, reapers, gleaners, because it's fall, the season of decay. The sleepers make room in the grave. In my tread, I tote a grain, a mite, contaminants to subdivide and eat these fascia clean of life and featureless forever. Deep trench, abide, as earthly gla glaciers lie down in still waters of erasure. There's two more. To lie down in still waters of erasure, rinsed in noise, static from old landlines, debrides the air, plastic phones and dumps revise their toxic compositions. 300 feet rise from the factory roof, 150 souls are exported from Earth ahead of schedule. Phone rings, wrist lifts, eustachian fluid tilts, a vector communicates, one cell answers, one white note folds up in soft tissues. Oh, when will it come to light? My medium is air, O oh lung. I am your morbid bride in white veil, white wreath, white Ceraments, a flower, a novice, and an infiltrate. This is the last one. A flower, a novice, and an infiltrate. I'll die not like a princess, but a spy, behind a spray of camellias or ordinance. I'm an asp in the bunker, a rogue contractor. I cause disorder in the decimals and quotients. Like a star, I gutter and divide in the knocked up galaxy's gut. I flap my fetal gills and fail to thrive. As epigenetic code remembers trauma, as etymology carts a load of empire in its wake, as an epicenic hustler hides an apple in its throat, you bear my trace. When I shot you point blank, you wore the mark of my tack light. And when I hung you from the bridge alight, your arms contracted in their attitude of flight. So that's that sonnet cycle in progress. There's seven, but there should be 12. I know, it's, it's super drastic, but then, you know, so is drug-resistant re tuberculosis, guys. <laughs> Stay away from it if you can. All right, so um, that's it. So now for the end of the reading, for the next part of the reading, I am gonna read to you guys from my play, Dead Youth of the Leaks, if that sounds okay. So it's gonna be a story, and hopefully you'll follow it. So the situation is this. So I live in Indiana. Anybody here from Indiana? What, what? You're right. So I live, I live in Indiana, and how this play got started is, I heard that, um, do you guys remember the first year of the Obama administration, there were the Somali pirates? And um, Obama really proved his manhood by sending the Navy SEALs in there and like, going house on them. And only one was brought to justice in the United States, and they put him on trial. His name is Abdul Ali Abdul Qadir Musa, and he's a teenager. But they're like, oh no, this guy's a ringleader. And like, great, we caught him. And, you know, mission accomplished. And they brought him, and he's going to be in jail for like until he's 50 at the federal penitentiary in Terre Haute, Indiana which is also where Jahar Sarnev is and uh, where they executed Tim McVeigh. So Terre Haute, Indiana turns out to be kind of an important place in the universe in a certain way of thinking. But I wrote this, when I found out that he, like me, was an inmate of Indiana, I wrote this play as a kind of <laughs> sp spell for his protection. Obviously, he's in maximum security. And as I started doing it, just different things started sticking to it. And this is the play I ended up with. Okay, so here's the plot. Julian Assange, c'est moi, Julian Assange has um, hijacked a container ship full of dead youth. And the dead youth are this plural character. They're dead teenagers. And they've died by all the ways that teenager might unfortunately die in uh, the Anthropocene. So some of them have been killed by drones, drug overdoses, suicide, drug wars, they're soldiers, you know, accidents, carcinogens, whatever it might be, these poor teenagers cannot, have not been able to survive it and they're dead. But Julian Assange is very benevolent 
he's gathered them up and he's going to take them to Magnetic Island, which is where he's actually from um, in Queensland, and he's going to save their lives by rebooting them into the, onto the, and, and uploading them onto the internet. Some kind of mysterious process. That's Julian Assange. That's what he's after. He's the main, that's the main plot. Dead youth and Julian Assange on the boat. But a pirate, mysteriously, gets on the boat, Abdulwali, Abdul Qadir Mizza, and he has his own needs. So that's the main plot, and then there's only one more ingredient that you need to know. This is kind of a messed up tempest, right? You can see the tempestness happening. And uh, so there's a deity here. The deity is the prologue, and the prologue is played by Henrietta Lacks. So did you guys read that book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks? So this is a real figure, um, an African-American woman who died of cervical cancer in 1951 at Johns Hopkins. And when she died, they, without anyone's consent, they harvested her cancer cells. And those cells have been kept alive in culture since 1951. And they form the basis of tons of medical discoveries and some corporate discoveries, too. They've just been dispersed across the planet. They're being worked on in many labs, I'm sure, at this university. Has anybody read about this before? Any of you guys pre-med? Yeah, the Gila line. So or the Gila line. So she has this immortality, right? That's the term that her biographer coined for it. And um, I decided to make her the deity, um, the immortal, and to make her in charge of everything. Everyone has to make her happy or else the ship goes nowhere. That's the plot. Are you ready? So we're going to start. We're going to start. I'm just going to read it to you until we're out of time. And I think you'll, I think you'll like it. OK. So we're going to start with, with the prologue. Henrietta Lacks, and then we'll move to the main action, and then we'll just see what else we have time for, okay? So here it is, Dead Youth of the Leaks. I'm gonna do all the parts. I'm gonna stand in funny ways, so you know it's different for snocking, and uh, here we go. Prologue, Henrietta Lacks. She is a 30-year-old African-American woman, dressed smartly in 1940s attire. She stands in a three-quarter pose and holds herself with dynamic, compact self-saturation. There's a famous photograph of her where she is standing this way. Here's what she says. Hello, I am your prologue also known as protege. My hair and blouse are neatly pressed, my locks curled as if dancing towards my face. My nails are short but red, without a chip. And because I am a mother, I have to work in death as I did in life. Dead youth are the dark energy of this play. They propagate a field in a void, an inverted internet, a compound interest that tugs information through dark portals, chased around by government men. In death, they find no rest. Decoy, decoy, and then, target interface, they blow up again. We're steering upstream on death's current. We're steering the ship by starlight, on sheer infamy. We're steering it with clarity, on sex drive, on instinct, which means we're steering it in a dream. Close the shutters. Take the marquee down. This Bates Motel with its dead birds and killer boys inside shall sail on, marooned in night. Did I mention my name is Henrietta Lacks? All that you know about polio, space travel, most drugs, how to make cells split in a finger bowl forever, you know because I died a howling death of cervical cancer in a colored ward at Johns Hopkins, Baltimore, 1951. When they autopsied me, I wore a white nightgown of malignant pearls inside my body, as if I had, were a queen that had swallowed my own crown, or a demented bride with her own cake sewn up inside. Those bad cells went on doubling after my death, doubled and were sold off to labs and doubled again, suffered the rest of the 20th sea without me, suffered space travel, suffered bombs, made mice sick, wore makeup and took drugs. I was immortal in my ability to be knocked down and spread myself out to take the punch again. In this sense, I am still a mother. I am forever taking a punch in the gut. No one asked for my consent. And now the author of this play forces me to stand up here and say these words. A throw of the dice cannot abolish chance. My body is this ship. My body is this play. My body is gravity rocking this ship in the belly of the play. The play rides inside me as a thought rides inside a thought as a triply encrypted message in a junk envelope dances around the internet with unnatural suavity. It arrives on the inside of the second and reveals a second to have an inside, a dark interstices made of undecidability, made of me. 
I have had to invent the whole world for you, once again from scratch, rocking the ship in the belly of the play. In the belly of the ship, flip-flops, guns, relief supplies. In the belly of this play, a grifter, a pirate, a poser, dead youth. Dead youth are really the subject of this play. Did I mention I am a mother? Did I mention I am a mother? A dead mother, a dead mother. A black electric energy blooms from me. I've smuggled it here from the 20th sea. Did I mention I am a mother? I am. It's Mother's Day. From now on, I am the author of this play. So now we move to the to shipboard. There's a there's a press conference going on. Julian Assange, uh, the dead youth have been doing crazy things, and Julian Assange is trying to address the press, but he's distracted by them. And here we go. Hello, my name is Julian Assange. Thank you for your attention to these burqa teens. They are in a work-study program. They are studying abroad. They are in juvenile detention. They are receiving extra credit. They are part of a goodwill exchange between our two nations. They are on a chain gang. They are all out on work release. Though dead, they are studying for their GEDs and degrees in dance therapy. I would like to deliver my prepared remarks but I am distracted by these teens. They are a member of a dance team. They are on their way to an abstinence convention. They are drinking absinthe. They are aspiring drone pilots. They are on their way to an interfaith prayer breakfast. They shot two convenience store clerks for $100. Their van has crashed and they are walking along the highway. If they do not find gas soon, they will have to eat the weakest one. They are going completely feral just a few miles from the highway, listening to death metal, practicing magic. They are running pornographic services out of their bedrooms. They're at soccer practice. They work on their uncle's convenience store at night. They do their algebra homework. They study war. They are boy soldiers, hustlers, and knockoff jihadi. They invented Facebook. They are entrepreneurs and visionaries, ex-game competitors, budding baristas, junior rapists, virgin martyrs, and walking delinquencies. They are beauties and atrocities. I can't stop looking at them. They could not survive what was required of them. I will now deliver my prepared remarks, prepared for me by the author of this feast, which is a cell line or fate. This ship is full of noises, and the isle is full of teens. I'm bundling up strong information and strong ribbons, junk for its own protection and tossing into the sea. Perhaps you've seen the tempest. Perhaps you know how this ends. Some things sink while other things float. Others are enraptured in a tree we call this plot. And though I am a well-known evangeline for privacy, I'm no angel more like an ancient Greek. I like to lift the cloak off a diplomatic channel and watch the current freak. I love privacy. I love transparency. Dead youth, except I love secret identities. I am mixed on the subject of redaction. I am a leftist. I don't hate the state, except I believe emperors should be naked. Oh, complexity, here's a riddle for you to work out. Lightning bugs, paparazzi, abominable secrecy, delectable privacy, holy transparency, cursed detectability, desired accountability, like alive or dead in the box. What's that cat thinking? The box is the internet. One cat brain is the leaker, another brain cell is the leak receiver. The nearest synapse is the battle creek. But the leak doesn't cross there. It jumps all over the brain, lighting up every synapse in a total war, a grand mal, till no one knows where it's going or where it has been. Oh, device maudit. Oh, seizure. Oh, brain on work release from the regime of cause and effect. Eventually, it reaches its destination, me, and I publish it on WikiLeaks, and that's an end. Game over, kitty cat. Zap, zap. Oh, WikiLeaks. Nymph stage, perfect gesture at the perfect time in the minute life cycle of a day fly, which has to die at day's end, lump it or leave it, leak or limp. I wanted to build on you, but who can build on lymph? Our mistake was to publish that leak ourselves and not just ship them to some other destination. We were left holding the bag with the cat out, became the chopping block, target practice. We were happy to take the blows from those conquistadors, arquebuses, and blunderbusses. Really, we were. But when the banksters and credit card companies blocked our pipeline of donations, that was really an end. Oh, WikiLeaks, I swear to revive you once I reach my destination with the help of these fun-loving dead youth. Now I'd like to introduce dead youth and thereby a portion of the plot. Okay, so then the dead youth come out and they're going to introduce themselves. But remember, it's a, it's a plural character. So they're all sort of saying this at once, one after the other. Hi, I'm dead youth. 
also known as the lion at the Baghdad Zoo. Air back to Stockholm, there I went, symptomatic, comatic, asthmatic, astigmatic, but in my distress, I did perfect the hologram kick, like Zlatan Jr., Ibrahimovic. But when soldiers filled the stadium with their carbines, biceps, and rank nasturtiums, I was laid out on the pitch. Dead, I fled to a dream Zurich, where I died again of insight. I patted on gold paws, lived on in the spelt vaults, read the golden embossments, memorized the serial number, my brain better than a supercomputer. I maintain like a mainframe, but more better splendor. Still, you can't live on love. Well, not forever. So, hello, I'm dead again. Some bored John killed me, some bulldozer, a falling wall, a body bomb answering its phone, a day's work at the dump, pulling the laptop apart for its medals, playing an extra in an international Ponzi scheme, come Gotterdammerung, I was a mule or a camel, the deal gone bad, I was hung from the overpass, headless with a name carved on my chest. Each time I came back from the dead, now I'm dead, and my knowledge too, unless Julian Assange can quickly speed me to port to reboot. Till then, I'm just idling here on the deck, though I was heading for art's shores. Julian Assange. Oh, art. That destination's too lofty. I have another one in mind. In farthest Queensland, my colony, Magnetic Island, named for a mythical sleeping force that made Captain Cook's cock, um, compass, leap up like a robin, directing him for the shore, indetectable forevermore. That black allure could shock all the new Sony AM dream machines, crack safes, forge canvases, eat the coat off any barnacled bit of credit card strip or VHS cassette. I lived there in a lean-to, as my mother lived in bikinis. Later, we went to a shelter on the mainland for battered moms and teens. She bought me a Commodore 64 on credit because she loved me. We lived like battery hens on chips. I peck pecked our eight bits. Lean times, dear mother. On our notorious hair, we brushed a deleterious dye called Invisiblonde, called slender prey's intoxicating hide. Assange and dead youth. My mother, John Bonet, and me. My mother, Margaret Thatcher. My mother, Henrietta Lacks. My mother, Antigone. My mother, strong correlation, palingenesis, telomerase, recapitulation. My mother, 20th C. My mother, ancient. My mother, epicene. My mother, in suburbia. My mother, sleeper cell. My mother, human error, yellow cake or Zyklon B. My mother migrating heron that chopped up in the engine brings down the corporate jet. My mother trashed reputation. My mother Hitchcock blonde. My mother windswept highlands. My mother up to my mother bog. My mother bared midriff, dirndl, sari, sandal, buckskin, wristwatch, hijab, who survived my birth, but barely, whose idea of groceries was a bottle of bleach or pills, a donation to the church or the panthers, lived on in a vat of spaghetti, died in a petri dish. My mother in Arcadia ego. My mother botulinum in hypo, wiped toilets and gloves in smock, played bridge an evening dress, sabotaged the train bridge, shot up the bank vault, worked the third ship, was throttled in halter top, was choked in a stocking, was brought up on charges, became a rogue signatory, no longer agreed to the plot, divested of media resources. She became a relentless top and crashed the last century's banquet, a radioactive grain in every dish, and her name was Estrogena, Aspartame, Natikiana, Philidamina, Saccharina, Carcinoma, Sacerdota, Carmen, Carcinogen. Hello, I'm Julian Assange. I've been assassinated by my mother. My mother was divine, a divine assassination. She edited and improved me. She shot me full of gold, protected me, guilt me, guided me, hid me, and brought me a Commodore 64. Now I endeavor to be golden like my mother, to radiate hot pixels of information, to sell divide forever, to stage a pussy riot, to offer teens of all nations hot gobbets of information, pus gold and liberating the rays of my information. These little pets you see gathered here around me are little runts. I've collected them from the NICU ward, a memorial hospital in South Bend, Indiana. Poor things were born addicted to oxycodone, oxycontin, valium, and other narcotics, born like princesses with lotus feet. Only thing fits them are Nikes and IVs. Poor things are asleep. I had to save them from a cuddler army of 54 retiree church organists and invasive species, and I carry this box a little code to feed them on, sorry, a little comb, their bees. Please help yourself before helping others, my little species, my little protégés. It's on demand. 
It's all you can eat on repeat forever. In the event of two similar die-offs, the greater of two die-offs is still similar. Infinity resembles infinity to the dead. That's why they need a mom like me and how I can be one. Resemblance is a magic power. I copy my mother and I live here in drag like a mortal. I just don't have a normal mortal motor. I'm abnormal mater, abnormal matter, but unlike cancer, I have a motive. It's to keep these teens alive on the internet. I feed them like roses, I feed them privacy. My motive is indetectable to you because you don't want to see it. But my morality is a rare and strong growth. It configures a colony. It grows in night vision, and it thrives on unnatural light. Abdiwali Abdul Qadir Musa enters. Assange, I have arrived. Assange and all the dead youth. How now, dead youth? Although I am a teen, I am not dead. I have come to occupy this ship. I need it. Okay, so lots of foolishness ensues, as you might imagine, uh, there with the very noble Abduwali and all this crazy dead youth stuff going on. And the result is that um, that the uh, prologue, Henrietta Lacks gets very irritated and withdraws her favor. And so then everybody has to figure out, and she stop, when she withdraws her favor, the ship stops moving. So everybody has to figure out how to help get the ship moving again, and they decide to do this dance. So I'm almost done. I have two more things I want to read you. This is one. And um, they sing the song, and they do this dance uh, to try to propitiate her. And the chant that you're going to hear is, is various names of Magnetic Island, uh, uh, an aboriginal name, a nickname, and then the name Magnetic Island, which is actually where he's from. So here we go. So picture it. A lot of nonsense has happened, and the prologue is disgusted and has, is not helping them anymore. And so they try this. Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle. Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle. Esperanto, smartphone, green banker, microchip, paraben, and microloan. Magnetic Island. Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle. Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle. Coca-Cola, 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 Motorola, War on Terra, Andy Warhol, Magnetic Island, Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle, Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle. Zombie music, therapeutic, cash infusion, vaccine program, carabinieri, World Bank, Magnetic Island. Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle. Magnetic Island, Yimbanun, Maggie Isle. Austerities, Mysterium, Deliriums, Magisterium, Disappearing Notional Wealth. Combat Diamond, Combat Metal, Combat Water, Combat Home, Combat Jacket, Combat Trauma, Combat Pay, Combat Training, Combat Rape, Combat Breathing, Combat Stance, and Payday Loan, Magnetic Island, Yumbanun, Maggie Isle, Magnetic Island, Yumbanun, Maggie Isle. Adar, Abdurrahman, Hassan, Christina Shane, Weabu, Shahadika, Rushmel, Tramel Sturges, De Separacida, De Separacida, De Separacida, De Separacida, Magnetic Island, Yumbanun, Maggie Isle. Magnetic Island, Yumbanun, Maggie Isle. Prologue. I am propitiated. I propagate my malicious line, Assange, we move. So they move, and they go to Magnetic Island, and I will not tell you what happens there. You have to get the book to find out and perform this with all of your freaky friends. Collect all your most freaky friends and your grandma and do this over the holidays, maybe Thanksgiving, and you'll find out what happens. Okay, do you want to hear, do you want to hear from Assange, or do you want to hear the epilogue? Have you had enough Assange? I can enough of him? Okay, I'll read the epilogue. This is what she has to say. Prologue as epilogue. She comes back in. There was lots of exciting plot events, I promise, and then she comes back in at the end. The play is over. I'm still me. 
I have transformed myself to epilogue, also known as epithelia, not known as apology. The past is resourceful. It does not wait. It contaminates the future with its DNA mistakes. The past sails like a sinking ship that does not sink but leaks waste till the bottom of the sea is barren and a dense mat of toxins overgrows the earth rank as a fridge after a hurricane. The aisle is full of dead fridges going green. There is no exit. I sit at the lab bench and I eat my lunch. The lab is deserted. The scientist is dead who first harvested my tumor and sentenced me to immortality. I, who was only known for hospitality, to be rewrit as permanent malignancy. I grow and I grow alone in culture. I write code. I distribute copies. I propagate my line. Maybe I am Queen Bee in my colony. Maybe I am Queen Hacker, Queen Julian Assange, because I make everything over with my queer authority. I change my hair when I am being followed. No, I cannot change my hair. It always stays just like this, dancing towards my face. I participated in this human drama because the immortal must have their amusements and because it makes a change, and I cannot change. I must perform my toxic ministry forever. I never go off shift. Julian Assange, all secrets are the same secret. The only secret is this. The only emperor is malignancy. That's human nature. Malignancy, atrocity, maliciousness, malevolence, violence, exploitation, abjection, laughable naivete, and no expiration date until the end of the Anthropocene. And after that, who knows? I predict my after afterlife will be like this. When the freezers went out of current, when the vials in the petri dishes warm, when my cells and cultures grow without human hands to coax them, I'll find no relief from immortality, but must always grow more of me. Dead bell, dead bell, I ring for thee. The suffering and the malignant, the greedy and the helpless, the vulnerable and the rich, the unfit and the fit, the guilty and the blameless. I am the mother of these. There is enough of me for each of thee. I am unlimited credit. I am unlimited debt. I am the mother of this planet. I am forced to be. I am forced to be yoked to thee, Anthropocene. Fate would not let me die with that 20th C. Now I myself am fate. I ride the night bus. I travel on the maternal line. I arrive ahead of schedule. I speed time. I clasp the future to my breast like a Bible, a pearl-toothed baby, or a pest. I let it sink its teeth in me. I let it lower its pipette deep down into my malignant lair and drink from me until the future looks like me and acts like me and is me as I am forced to be the future with its brown hair dancing towards its face, its skin light and smooth as a fawn's, its painted nails abide no chip, it rests slim fingers on its woman's hips. This futurity is a kind of divinity. It has a name like me, Henrietta Lacks. Thank you. <laughs>